are starting a brand new series today, and um, it's going to be a series that's going to last for a while, and I don't want to discourage you on that one, um, but uh, <clears throat> we're going to break it up into about three series, actually. Um, but the series, you can see the title, God is Here, simply that, and it's about the presence of God in our lives. If you didn't listen, and hopefully, you know one of the reasons why we put the words on the screen for the songs rather than just an old hymn book? is so many of us, we got to memorize hymn books that we could, the pages automatically opened, uh, I think, to some of the, the verses, and we just sort of learned the rhythm, and we didn't really pay attention to words. That last song, come now found, that last verse, it says, prone to, to leave the God I love, prone to wander. The, 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 the author of that hymn was so obviously true, because that's what we do sometimes. We are prone to do that. We are prone to wander from God, and, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about is why are we prone to wander from God? But it leads me into this thinking, when we look at this one sentence, three words, and, and I would say this about today, three words that could change your life. And, and when I say that, it sort of scares me. Because there's something I've realized in my life since I was a kid, and really, it, it's, it's such an, a thread through our culture now that you probably would agree with me, although there's somebody going to be like, no, I don't see that. But it, here it is. The truth of the matter is, since I've been a kid... And maybe you're not like me. Maybe you're just so, maybe I'm just the weird one here. Let's just put it in. Somebody's going to say, yeah, you are. Um, that's okay. But maybe I'm just so different that I see things differently. But here's the truth that I've learned since I was a kid. That most things in life overpromise and underdeliver. I mean, just stop and think about that. Overpromise, underdeliver. When I was a kid, man, there were things, I remember when I first got to understanding life and, and things that, that were advertised and what I saw other people have, I just thought like, boy, it'd be cool if I had that. And, and even, it, it wasn't even things, too. I was the youngest in my family. How many of you guys are babies in your family? Like, you were the youngest born. I was the youngest in my family. I had two older brothers and an older sister, and they were much older. And so I was always like that kid that tagged along. Um, but I remember being told things like, hey, there'll be a day when you get to do this. <laughs> I hated that. I hated that, but I always looked forward to it, and it over-promised and under-delivered. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't quite as good as I thought it was going to be. It wasn't quite the same. It, it wasn't that all the things in life were bad. It just wasn't that quite as good. It's sort of like nowadays. Have you ever noticed this? And, and my wife and I, we noticed this. In fact, we had a really disappointing um, thing happen to us on this, but we saw a commercial for fast food. I won't even name the establishment, but fast food. It's very close to us. <laughs> yeah, so you guys already figured it. And, and they were advertising these chicken sandwiches. It's very close to us. It's the closest place we can go. Okay. And I looked, and I remember thinking that night I was hungry, and it looked so good. And I said, you know, they're having this chicken sandwich war going on between Chick-fil-A and Popeyes. And, and whoever, everybody else seems to have one now. And maybe this particular place, which I'm not naming, maybe it's going to be that good. It just looks really good. And, it, I mean, just everything looks so good. And so we went and we each got one. And after two minutes into it, we both looked at each other and said, Wow, this is the worst thing I've ever had. This is sad. I didn't know it could be this bad. I would never buy this again. It doesn't look at all like what was shown on the... You ever, you ever been there? Like, you ever looked at a McDonald's commercial? I was thinking Brandon had his McDonald's drink, but the, the drinks are okay. I'm just talking about, like, you ever seen the Big Mac, right? The Big Mac I get, when I get a Big Mac at McDonald's, looks like they took the box, put everything in it, and then shook it up. You, you ever had that one? Or you go to, you see the, the Burger King commercial, which I almost feel bad about Burger King these days if you're a Burger King fan. They're no longer American, you know that. A Canadian company bought them, now they're Canadian. Mm. Anyway, has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, you ever watch the Burger King commercial and there's that flame grilled Whopper and they show the flames coming up and it's perfectly cooked and the cheese is perfectly melted and the tomato slices look like it came out of your garden, because I don't have a garden. And uh, everything looks perfectly done. And then you go and you order one because it looks so good because you're thinking, boy, you know, I've had one of those in a long time. <laughs> it is just such a disappointment. The patty is not even hot enough to melt the American cheese that's sitting on top of it. The tomato is anemic. And whatever you ask not to have put on yours, 
it's on there in, in mass proportions, and we won't even get to that story. Because they overpromise and underdeliver, and everybody's like, no, 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 this is marketing. But that, that's what we live in this world today, don't we? I mean, everything's overpromised. I remember things as a kid, and, and as the youngest in my family, I get, kept getting told things like, well, just wait till you can drive. <laughs> and boy, that wasn't as cool as I thought. It, it was cool, don't get me wrong. But nowadays, I've been driving for a while, and there are times I'm like, well, Sheila, why don't you drive? Um, I just don't want to. I'm tired. I, I just, uh, driving's overrated sometimes. Um, we, we get these things. We go, Wait till you turn 21. Ever heard that one? Or wait till you turn 18, you can vote. That is way overpromised, and, and that underdelivers a lot. I'm just saying. Those are things in our life. But here's something that if we're all, uh, does everybody agree that we probably are overpromised and underdelivered in our society more than any other time in this world? But the problem is, I think we've taken that into our lives. And when we look at a verse like John 10.10, which is not in our notes today, it's not even on screen, John 10.10, where Jesus says, hey, I've come to give you life and give it to the full or give it more abundantly or however you want to say it. We've read that verse so many times. I've taught a series on that since I've been here. And we look at it, we go, maybe Jesus is just in the marketing realm. Because maybe Jesus is once again over-promising and under because my life doesn't seem to have all the kick, all the, the blessings, all the good things that I think. And, and really, when we get down to it, we wonder, and, and then I look at church, and, and though we have a good crowd today, I'm telling you, I was, I was at a large church on Monday night where their, average, or their attendance last Sunday, a, a church that probably holds twice as many as ours, they had 41. And, and I'm hearing that's more of the norm for most churches in our area. And I sat back and I thought, wow, why are churches empty? Because people like me probably get up on Sundays and sometimes we overpromise and underdeliver. deliver because we talk about things that aren't maybe what God would talk about. And we've taught people in our lives that Christianity maybe overpromises and underdelivers. Because we tend to think and value things that are more important than what God is. And that's a sad serious thing to get down to it. You know, when I think about this this one statement here and you may never have thought about this statement, but the statement God is here. No, that's not a typo by the way. It is a capital G, capital O, capital D on purpose. God is here. Because when we take that and put that into our lives and we apply it to our life and we talk about the presence of God in our life, it is the most important sentence that could ever happen. And I will, I will do my best today to prove it to you by the end of this, this time that we're going to spend together. But let me tell you, if you take that, that one sentence, God is here, and you change it to anything else, what you'll end up with is a halfway life, a less than life, or a dead life that does you no good really does. And it just becomes religion, tradition, what most churches are full of today. Just be honest with you. That's why most churches are dead or dying. Because they forgot this one sentence that changes everything. And here's the promise. But before we get to the promise, we're going to have to look at, and I want to look at just three ways sometimes we change this, this sentence. The first one is just simply by making God into lowercase. It's a life killer. God, with a little g, a little o, a little d, that's our first problem here. Because when we do this, we take God and make him a small God. And so he becomes small, he becomes unexceptional, and he's very uninteresting. And you know what? Most people, when they come to church, they think of that. Oh, no, i got to put in my time because it's boring in church. I don't know. Who made the rule that church has to be boring, by the way? I mean... I love, I, you know what is this point? By the way, if you ever watched our video last week, I have to apologize publicly because Donnie got cut out, um, and, and he knows it, but the mics didn't pick him up for some reason, and so all his singing, which was really good last week, and if you missed last week, um, I love stuff like that. If you're like, oh, we shouldn't do that fun stuff in church, you just don't know who God is because God has a good sense of humor. I know that because I've seen you. <laughs> yeah. I've seen me too, so don't worry. Um, but God loves to have a good time. In fact, God delights in us, and he wants us to delight in him. That's part of it. But sometimes we say, no, no, our sentence, God is here, becomes little g, little o, little d, God is here. And what we're saying is this is a small God. And somewhere in Christianity, someone has told us that our God is small. He can't handle, he can't handle things. He's dull. He's boring. He's got a list of rules. He's got a list of things that that you can't do. He doesn't want you to enjoy life. He doesn't want you to enjoy him. And it's all these restrictions in life. And whether it's, you know, some people, when you get down to it, 
your memories of church become things like a bag of Cheerios that your mom used to give you while you sort of laid on her. On her. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody else have that? Like mom brought Cheerios with her to church? So, yay! Yeah, there you go. And you know what? That's that, my friends, though, is sometimes the thing that we think about church and about God because we think God is so small. In fact, um, it reminds me, I read this survey, and, 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 and when you think of God, actually, when you think of God, what pops into your, your mind? I mean, where does God rate on your list of all-time coolest people to hang out with? It probably doesn't. I mean, just to be honest with you. We don't really think of it. We think of guys like Donnie, who's really cool to hang out with because he's so much fun. He really is. And, and other people. Um, Donnie is one of my favorite guys to hang out with because he's, <laughs> he's a laugh a minute. He really is. And so, anyway, Donnie, you're getting a lot of attention today. But anyway, they gave a survey to Christians. Now, when I say Christians, they define this as people who, regularly, who said they are followers of Jesus Christ who regularly attended church at least once a week on average. Okay? Once a week on average. They asked a question, and the age group was between 40 and 16. So these are younger mindsets, okay? These aren't old, traditional Christians. These are younger mindsets, the, the younger generation. They asked a, a survey, and this question was asked, what would make this year the happiest year of your life? Now, as I asked that, I want you to start thinking about it. Like, what would you answer? And there are all kinds of good answers, some really cool stuff, um, Great answers. People talked about, like, if I got engaged, if I got married, if I did, did all these different things. But here's the disappointing thing. On the survey of all Christians, zero, zero people mentioned God. Not one person in this survey of thousands of people who are Christians go to church at least once a week, not one of them mentioned God. And when, they, when the question was asked, what would make this year the happiest year of your life? People talked about better your jobs, winning the lottery, girlfriends, boyfriends, engagements, weddings, all kinds of different events, vacation sites, new vehicles, new houses. Not one person, and these were all Christ followers, mentioned God. Wow. Why? Because we don't think much of God. We've made him into that little g, little o, little d. And the results of turning our caps lock off in our mind are tragic. Why? Because when you start thinking of this capital G, capital O, capital D in a smaller case, where he's small, insignificant, and uninteresting, then you know what? Heaven's not quite as real as it used to be. Neither is hell, though. And sin seems to be a little bit better and easier to do. A little bit more promise there. Joy seems to be out of our reach, and we get engaged in the mundane, and we forget about what is important in life, and our values change. They really do. But what if we just remembered how big God really was? Wouldn't that change everything? Because the presence of God would make things different, wouldn't it? Life killer number two is if we took that sentence, God is here, and we changed it to God will be here. Now, yeah, we still made him a capital G-O-D, but this time we said instead it is here, we said will be. And you know, that's one of those problems because that's thinking of the presence of God is something that will be instead of something that already is. And that's a problem. Back on that survey, remember the survey I talked to you about? They asked this question on the survey. What does your faith mean to you? Now, remember, these are all Christians, so this isn't a variety of different responses from people who don't believe in Jesus Christ. What does your faith mean to you? The number one answer was, my faith means, and this is, this is probably something that would be common in here, too, to be honest with you, but my faith means that I will go to heaven when I die. Now, you say, well, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. It, it is. It's a mixed answer, though. Think about this. Because when you say that, that my faith means that I'll go to heaven when I die, basically you're saying that God doesn't really do me any good until I'm dead. That's the problem with God will be here. One day. One day I'm going to settle down and serve God. One day I'm going to live right. One day I'm going to do the things that matter in life. One day, but not today. One day I'm going to be okay with God, because God isn't here yet. He will be here, and that's the problem. And when I see that, I often wonder about what happens to those people that have that kind of thinking in our lives. Because when we have that thinking about God's going to be important when I'm dead, what about when I go through those dark valleys of life? When I'm in the operating room, when I hear the bad news about losing a life or something that I've had in my life go on? What about when you hear the words like cancer or COVID or, or whatever other word that might pop up? What do you do then? 
You do what David did. Psalm 23, 4, right? Even when I walk in the darkest valleys, I will fear no evil because you are with me. See, David, the the great king of Israel, David said, hey, you know what? It's the presence of God right now that makes the biggest difference in my life, Psalm 23, 4. And so he didn't want to accept that statement as God will be here. It is God is here. See, walking through life's darkest valleys would be terrible. There'd be no hope if we thought it was only in the future. Paul understood this truth. If you, if you have your Bibles or you can just follow along on screen, I just want to read a couple of verses. And this isn't our text text. This is still the introduction. In, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul had this understanding. And so I want to put it into a New Testament context too. In Philippians chapter 4, by the way, it's such a great, we're just going to take some excerpts out of it, but it's such a great passage. I, I'm not preaching out of that passage today. So we just want to hit a couple of highlights. But Philippians chapter 4, He says things like this, rejoice in the Lord always, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Wow, that's awesome. And then he goes on down in verse 5, and he says, the Lord is near. He goes, keep going down, and if you read through this, and he's given us all these different things. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He tells us to take our prayers and our petitions and our our, our requests to God. And then he says in verse 7, and the peace of God. Wouldn't we all like to have that? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Uh, and, and it's just an amazing promise there. And then he gets so far into it, we'll skip down to verse number 12, and he says this one little statement, as he's sitting in prison, by the way, let me, let me put it in context. He's sitting in prison, and he says, I have learned to be content. So basically, Paul, in this little, these four verses here, he says, I, I've, I've, I'm going to rejoice all the time, so I've got joy in my life, I've got peace from God, and I've learned to be content. And what's the secret to it all? If you ask Paul, you go back to verse number five, and he says, the Lord is near. Or I would say it this way, the Lord is here. Paul believed in the presence of God as he's sitting in a prison cell, soon to have his head taken off his shoulders because the Romans didn't like him very much. Because he was preaching about a new king, King Jesus. Life killer number three. We've talked about little g, little o, little d is here. God will be here, and life killer number three is that God is there. Out of all three of these, this one has more of a a truth to it than the others, but it's still a subtle truth that really is shaded in some lies, too. The problem with God is there is the fact that uh, we assume that God would want a God like, like the Bible talks about would like to be with other people than with us because we know who we are. And that's why we don't believe in God's presence in our life. And it kills what we have. It changes the way we view things. Because God's over there with them. In fact, we do this so often in our life. We look at our lives and we see somebody else who's getting blessings in their lives that we think we should have. We go, man, God's blessing them there, but God's not here with me. And we despair. We think that God's not here. He's there. And sometimes in our life, we look back at our past and we go, man, (laughs) the things I've done, the things I've done... God couldn't forgive me for. The things I've done, God couldn't help me with. And we look at our past, and each one, by the way, is a secret that maybe you didn't know, is everyone has a past. There are no perfect people. We're a whole bunch of sinners. And, 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 and sin is sin, just like dirt is dirt. I'm just saying, the, the one sin you've got to be scared of is the sin that separates you from God, and that's the one that sends us to hell. It's not believing Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That's the truth. But sin is sin. We've all got speckled past. But that's why Jesus is full of grace. See, the problem, though, <laughs> and this is the truth in this statement that God is, is there, is the fact that sin is a separator. It is. It's the great separator, right? It works in our relationships like this, right? So I was friends with this girl until she hit on my boyfriend, and then I don't like him anymore because she did that. Or, hey, you know what? I used to like them until I caught them gossiping about me, and psh- we're no longer friends. Or, hey, you know what? This buddy of mine at work, we were good until he stole my ideas and went to the boss with him. And then he got the promotion and I didn't. And what has happened there? I just gave you some examples of sin as a separator. Sin separates us. And it not just separates us from each other, but the ultimate sin separates us from God. It really does. In fact, over in, in Isaiah, God says these words through the prophet Isaiah, and he's speaking to the children of Israel, not directly to us, but we can apply them to us. He says this in Isaiah 59, verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
Your sins have hidden his face from you. And that's the truth. And, and, and he, there again, he's speaking to Israel because they had gone away from God. They had chosen to do some really horrible things, and they didn't care. And so God's pronouncing some judgment, and he's just telling them why. But he also says, if you read the first verse in that, that, that chapter in Isaiah 59, he says, hey, the Lord's arm's not short that he can't save. God's still not, it's not God that's the problem, it's us. Because sin, when I choose to let it, and this is where it's half truth, half lie, sin does separate me from God. But you know what the, the greatest thing about that is? And never forget this. God is much more than just a sin hater. God is a sinner lover. God is a sinner lover. And hey, well, you know what I just told you about all of us? We're all sinners. We've all done things that we're not proud of. We've all got things that we don't want to put on display for everybody to know. There's something about each one of us that really we don't want, deep down inside, we don't want anybody, even the person closest to us, to know, much less alone God. And you know what's great about God? Not only is he a, a sinner lover, but he's a God of grace. In fact, Paul put it this way. He said that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that great? He didn't wait for us to get cleaned up. And, you know, there's a lot of people that won't come into a church because they think they have to get right with God before they can come in or the walls are going to fall on them or something like that. And that's not true at all. This is the greatest place for the people who need God's grace the most. And if we as Christ followers think we're better than other people, shame on us. But God's not over there. God's right here, and that's where he wants to be, and that's the whole idea. You know, God is, is that God who gives us that. In fact, what you have to understand about Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ was passionate about getting you into God's presence. That's what his whole life was about. Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again so that God could be here and true to you and to me and to everyone. And that's the truth. So let's get to our text. Psalm 73. That's where we're at. You have your Bibles. Turn to Psalm 73. You say, that's a weird place. I was on this journey, and I have to admit, the truth of the matter is, sometimes in my life, go back to what I started off with, sometimes in my life, I thought maybe that Christianity overpromised and underdelivered. <laughs> I honestly did. I have to wonder sometimes, hey, is my life sometimes better? And I'm glad when I read the Bible and find out that, you know what, <laughs> other people had the same problem. This guy who wrote Psalm 73 was a guy named Asaph. And Asaph had written... He had written this, this song, they are songs, a long time ago, and he's a very wise guy, but for the first 20 verses of this psalm, Asaph, this writer who was actually a, a, a worship leader in Israel, he had written this song, and it's a song praising God, but sort of opening up and being transparent about his life, and he complains the way I would complain. Because basically, this is Asaph's first 20 verses. Asaph looks out, and he sees people, and he goes, hey, you know what? I'm tired of serving God. And the guys who aren't serving God are getting all the good stuff. I'm tired of evildoers getting away with it, and I'm following God. See, the, the Israelites back in the Old Testament had over 600 rules they had to keep every day of their life. I mean, they were, they, I, I've been reading in my devotional time through the book of Leviticus, and boy, I was like, wow, I'm glad I wasn't born back then, and I'm glad I wasn't an Israelite, because that was hard. Uh, 600 and some odd rules to keep every day, and I mean, they were meticulous about them. Some of them had to do with your clothing. Some of them had to do with your hair. Some, a lot of them had to do with what you ate. And I'm glad because I smoked some pork ribs the other day, and they were really good, and I couldn't eat those if I was an Israelite. I'm just telling you. I, there are some things I like to do, and I, I couldn't make it. But Asa's going, hey, I kept all these rules. I did everything that was asked, and I'm looking down the road, and the people who don't keep those rules, the people who aren't doing right, they got away with it. And I don't understand that. And he gets so upset that you get down to verse 22, and if you look at your Bibles, verse 22, he gets so honest and so transparent. He says this. He says, I was senseless and ignorant. Wow. Wow. That is pretty transparent, is it not? I, I mean, how many of you guys would stand up in church and go, hey, I was senseless and I was, this is a song they would sing in church, by the way. I was senseless, I was ignorant. I don't know if I'd do that. In fact, we don't do that on Sundays, right? We dress up and try to look nice and try to look like we know more than we, we are. We're better than we are, right? Asa's just really honest. He says, I was senseless and I was ignorant. And then he says this, I was a brute beast before you. And that, when you read that, you're like, what? What is he saying there? You know what he's saying there? He's saying, these things upset me so much that I was like this wild animal. I was just, I was angry. You ever seen someone who's so angry they're out of control? 
My, if my wife raises her hand, I'm going to have a problem. <laughs> I've been that guy before. Road rage, all these kind of things. Yeah, he goes, I was so upset by the way other people were getting blessed, and I was not. I was so upset that things didn't seem to be fair. I was doing what was right. I thought I was keeping all the rules. I was not getting what I wanted out of life. It was over-promised and under-delivered. And I'm so tired of it. And all of a sudden, I looked up and I realized how ignorant, how foolish, that I was just like a foolish wild animal. I was just going crazy. I was just knocking everything down. I, th I think the other day I saw a video of this, uh, this buffalo, bison. It was in a cage in a, a stall. and I, I don't know where it was at. I'm sure it was out in the Midwest somewhere. But this, this thing's huge, and it jumps over the cage confinement, the wall confinement, and this girl is, is like, she's freaking out about it, and I would have been freaking out too, because that thing's a wall, and that's the picture I had in my head. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you know what, I'm tired of following the rules, so I was acting like this out-of-control animal, just going crazy. I was bucking the system. I was, and he goes, I was doing this in front of you, God. And, and he's just being so honest here, and then he stops, and I love this because he helps me out so much because I'm, I, I, I can relate to this. Maybe you can't, but I can't. And he goes down to verse 25, and he says, you know what, I, I stopped because I had to think much more about God. In verse 25, he says this, whom have I in heaven but you? <laughs> I love that. See, what, what Asaph's saying here is, is when I think of heaven, when I think of heaven, I think of God, and, and, and he's saying, God, you're so good that you make heaven more heavenly. That's what he's saying there. He says, you know what? I forgot how good heaven is because I've been thinking about my problems and thinking about other people, and I have been dwelling, and you, God, are so good that you make heaven more heavenly. And then he goes on, he says the rest of it, he goes, hey, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. Wow. Really? Nothing? I mean, nothing I desire besides you? Because I find that... I struggled when he said that. I read that and I was like, really? Because I don't know if I could say that. Can you say that? Because I sit back in my life and go like, in a little while, my stomach's going to tell me there's something I desire to eat. I'm just being honest. And, and, you know, I look sometimes at my car. We had to have our car in the shop again this week. And I was like, sometimes, God, I, I desire to have a better car. And, and so, sometimes I desire to have this and desire to have that. And we all do these things, don't we? And yet, Asaph here, he's being honest, and he's being transparent. He says, hey, in earth, there's nothing I desire but you. And I realize what Asaph's saying, I didn't right away hit with, but I do now because what Asaph's saying is true in my life is just as much as it is in yours. You may not feel that way. You may, not, you may be listening today and say, I'm not even a Christ follower, and that's okay. But here's what Asaph's saying. He's saying, you know what? I don't want anything in my life that is going to fail. And everything here on earth will fail, but God won't. That's what he's saying. And he says, look at that verse again. He says, and earth has nothing I desire. Why? Because we don't want anything that's going to fall apart, fail, or anything. You don't want failed relationships, do you? You don't want failed jobs. You don't want failed houses and cars. You don't want failed anything. All those things will fail you. I've told you before, one of my favorite times of year is that Christmas, between Thanksgiving and Christmas time, where they start showing those commercials on TV. And I don't know why these commercials really make me feel good because um, I'm never going to buy one because I don't have the money for that. But you know those high-end commercials for cars like Mercedes-Benz and stuff like that that are really cool? And they, they have the pristine white snow and the trees that are all look like perfect trees. And I know there's not, no real place on earth like this. And, and the guy wakes up and he's, his wife bought him a car and it's wrapped with this big red bow and it's sitting in her living room and nobody can figure out how they got it in there. But and it's not leaking anything on the floor, and it's just perfect. And I'm like, oh, it makes me, I don't know why it makes me feel so like, oh, I love that commercial. Or they show Santa Claus driving with about six other cars in front of them, you know, to make it look like reindeer or whatever. And it's just uh, like, I like that one too. And the snow is always perfect. There's no yellow snow or brown snow or any of those other kind of things, uh, which makes me sad because I love dogs. But um, <laughs> so you're like, oh, I get the yellow snow now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, those things always make me feel so good, and I don't know why, but you know what I realized? Even if I bought 
the best car ever. I look out in the parking lot sometimes, and I look at some of you guys driving some nice vehicles. Ben, I mean, good grief, ben, Ben's got all these nice vehicles. And I sit back and go, wow. And then, you know what helps me through that? <laughs> when I realize in five years, you're going to have to get another one. <laughs> you're laughing. You have to, too. They're all going to fall apart. And that's what Asaph was telling us. Hey, you could go out and buy the best whatever car you want, truck, whatever it is. You could buy an RV. You can buy the best house. You can buy whatever. You can get the best relationship. But eventually, eventually, everything is going to fail. And that's why he said the most important thing that won't fail us, verse, verse 25, is nothing I desire besides you. You. <laughs> and I realized, like, hey, you know what? That's the greatest promise we have. Because we all want something that lasts, and we desire something that is forever, and the only thing that lasts and is forever is God. Not that little God. Not the God that will be here, but the capital G, capital O, capital D. You know, Asa's desires here taught me that I would never be satisfied with temporary blessings, temporary stuff. I always look for it sometimes, and that's when I realize how I'm living the wrong life. Man, I long for things that are so temporary. I long for, for and there's nothing wrong with some of these things. Don't, don't, I'm not preaching against things. That's, don't get me wrong here. But when they separate me from God, then they do become that sin thing. And that's the problem. You know, the problem I have with the cars, even those cool car commercials, or going to a great restaurant, I, mean, I don't know where you're heading for lunch, um, maybe whoever's cooking, Man, they're the best cooks on the planet. But the problem is, you're always going to need to eat again. You're always going to crave more. You're always going to want more. And that's a problem for us. The thing that lasts is God. And nothing short of that eternal God will ever be enough. And that's why he looks in the next verse and he declares this. Look at verse 26. He says, my flesh and my heart may fail. What he's acknowledging there is everything's temporary. Even my own life is temporary. He says, my heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Whew. Man, Ace has got it right, didn't he? God is everything. He's forever. He doesn't, hey, you want to invest? I've, I, I had friends that have told me over the years, like, you need to buy silver, you need to buy gold, you need to do this, you need to do that. You know, that's great, but I'm telling you, the only thing that I want to invest in that's going to last, and I know this sounds crazy, but invest in God in my life. Some of us were worried about retirement, and so we're trying to invest in, in jobs, invest in security, invest in what we got. I'm telling you, put everything on God. Go all in on him, because that is what psalmist learned here, Asaph learned. That's what David was telling us, that's what Paul was telling us, and we can see this all throughout the series, we're going to see this. And he gets to this, and, and Asaph, he says, hey, you know what? God is the portion of my strength. Where do we get the strength to do what we need to do every day? Not from our soulmates, not from our kids, not from our jobs, not from a good sense of accomplishment and all those other things. Not from a paycheck or anything else. Asaph says, hey, you know what? It's God. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. <laughs> and w w when he does that, it it's just simply God who's the answer to his, his problem. And, and since he realized this, that God is a portion and God will last forever, Asaph busts out in his happy dance, which I'm not going to do any happy dances for you because I don't do that very well. But look down, verse 28, and he comes to this conclusion. This is the greatest conclusion. But as for me, it is good to be near God. But as for me, it was good to be near God. That is so important in our lives. I've talked to people in our church. I've talked to people in, in this area. I've talked to, for years I've talked to people, and you know what the number one complaint is? They feel like God's so distant. Asa felt like that probably for the first 20-some verses of this, this psalm. And then he changed his outlook because he realized the one thing in life that's so important isn't his family, isn't his friends. It isn't his, his, his money, his house, his belongings, or anything else. And I know some of those things may shock you. It wasn't even his temple, his, his, his worship rituals or religion. You know what the one thing that was so important to him? 
He says, when he breaks out this happy dance, he says, but as for me, it's good to be near God. When was the last time you ever said that? Asaph says, you want the key to a good life, this happiness? Be near God. It's good to be near God. You know, I think this psalm would save us from sitting around waiting to die while we ride the roller coaster ride of life circumstances and how bad they can be. I think when you go through and you, you look through the psalmist, just take the book of Psalms sometimes and you start looking at God and you look through all the, the commands. The psalmist command us to praise God, to magnify God, to worship God, to exalt God, to lift him up, to glorify God. And what, what Asaph and David and all the other people who wrote these psalms, you know what they're doing? <laughs> they're urging you, they're urging me today to ditch that little g, little o, little d, to throw them away and embrace a God who's great, a God who wants to be in our life, a God who blesses us, maybe not the way we want, but more so the way we need. We need to think much, much more highly of God. You know, the problem, though, is so often my, my soul deals with its own dementia. And I, just like the, the song we sang right before I, I, we began today, prone to wander, Lord, prone to leave the one I love. God never leaves you. You may leave him, but he never leaves you. And, and if you don't get anything else out of today, here's what I want you to get. The presence of the right person changes everything. That's what, that's what this is all about. The presence of the right person changes everything. We run around looking for things to satisfy us that won't last, that are temporary, that are worthless presence of God. God is here. If we would just learn this one statement that we're going to look at for the next several weeks to come, it would change everything about us.